We're still in the gospel, still walking through this truth, because this truth, the gospel, is one of the most significant truths in all of history. And sometimes what you have to do is you have to take a truth and just let it settle. I was at a wedding yesterday, and, uh, and the guy, I, I was talking to him right before he was walking up, and I said, dude, you're getting married today. And I could tell, you just need to let that truth settle. I am. I, I am. And I said, the only thing you got to do is say I do, but if you can do that, the rest will come easy, sort of. I just lied to him. That was all right. Uh, he, he did not need any pressure in that moment. But he had to let that truth settle. That's the same way it is with the gospel. As we hear this truth, we have to let it settle in our heart and our lives and let it transform us. If you're new, if you're a visitor or just checking us out for the first time, then, then let me tell you what we're talking about when I say the word gospel because you're probably thinking, what in the world is that? Is that old school churchy stuff? What is it? The gospel is simply this. When God pours out his unmerited favor, his, his grace, his delight on us, God does that. Everything that God is, spiritual blessings, all those kind of things, he pours that out on us, gushing over us when we surrender to Jesus Christ. Now, that, that is basically the gospel in a nutshell. When we surrender, God pours all of those things out on us. And it's, and it's an experience that we have in surrendering. And sometimes as Christians, we have to re-surrender. Just say, hey, God, I'm still with you. I'm still on. Even though he sealed you once, sometimes it's good to go back. Just telling your wife, I love you one time at your wedding ceremony. It, it's good to say it more than that. That's sometimes what we need in our Christian walk. But that is what the gospel is. Us surrendering, and in that surrender, God pours out his amazing grace upon us. And that is a message that I think has to really settle in our souls because we have heard it, most of us, most of our Christian lives, or, or as long as we've been in church, we've heard that. But it's moving that knowledge from our mind to our hearts and knowing that when you wake up in the morning, God delights in you. When you go to work, that God delights in you. When, when, you, when you're doing the things that God calls you to do, even when you falter and fail, just like a good parent that wants to lift you up and say, hey, listen, you can do better. Still, in that moment, God delights in you. The gospel truth, as we let it settle in us, it will totally transform us. Now, today we're going to head to a, a section of Scripture that I really love. It's going to be good. It's 2 Corinthians. So if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to bring it or you have your Bible apps. Go ahead and, and pull those out and you can click there. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 17. And we're going to walk through those Scriptures a little bit, just kind of unpack it for us. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, New Testament for those that it may be new to you. Um, what we're going to do in these Scriptures, we're going to take a look at two things. We're going to see, one, what the gospel does in us. We're just going to give a quick picture of what God is doing in us with this gospel, this stuff that he's pouring into us. But we're also going to take a look at what the gospel hopes to do through us. Once we surrender and once God pours all this stuff out on us, there is something that the gospel propels us toward to do. It's not just about just sitting and soaking. There's something else in this process that God wants us to get. So we're going to take a look at that this morning. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Let me read this whole verse to you, and then we'll go back and, and break it down a little bit uh, as we kind of dive in. If you've got a pen, feel free to underline in your Bible too. Uh, that's not against the law. So here you go. 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, underline that. We're going to come back to If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation the old is gone and the new has come. Underline that one too. The old is gone and the new has come. These two phrases, I think, are really important for us to understand what the gospel is doing in us. You think about this when, when it says at this very beginning that, uh, therefore, if anyone has surrendered, if anyone is in Christ, do you realize that when you surrender to the gospel, that when you say, God, I, I want you and I'm yielding my life to you, in that moment, you are becoming in Christ. Do you, do you know what that means? A lot of us use that terminology or go, yeah, I'm in Christ. I totally get it. But do you really get what it means? Matt Chandler, uh, in, in a video series, has a great illustration about an airplane that I'll, I'm going to share with you, so it may be familiar to some, but the illustration begins in my own story. When, when I was a little kid growing up, I wanted to be able to do one thing. I wanted one superpower. I, I wanted to fly. 
It was something that I wished for, I, I wanted it. I was like, God, if you could just make me do anything, can you just let me fly? I just really wanted to do it. And so, you know, I'd followed the Disney version. When you wish upon a star, that is, that is a lie. It never happened. All these stars wishing. I'd even wished on street lights when they cut on. Anyway, it just never happened. So, I wish upon a star to fly. You know, I'd, I even, and this was not smart, so kids in the room do not do this, I, I even would eat leaves thinking, maybe I just eat the right combination of leaves growing up in this, I'm lucky I didn't die. It did something else to me, but it did not let me fly. Uh, you know, just everything that I could think of to do to get this superpower to fly. I just wanted to. It, just, it was just in me. I wanted to do it. Uh, and was always dreaming about it and wishing for it. Even, even I got practical. Uh, I had a tree house growing up. It was about 15 feet off the ground, and, and that was really cool, but you could climb on top of the treehouse and get into the really cool part of the tree. And I thought, you know, I'm just really not committed to this idea of flying enough. I mean, I'm dorking around with wishing and leaves. I, I need to just full-on commit. So what I decided to do is climb to the top of this treehouse and then climb up in the tree. And I just assumed... Honestly, if I just flapped my arms hard enough, I could do it. Now, I had a few practice runs on the ground, nothing. And I thought, all right, just, I need height. I need, that's how birds do it. I just need height. So I climbed up in this tree and got up on a branch. And my cousin, uh, who was down at below, was watching this whole time going, what in the world's going on? So I got to this branch and I basically was up there at the top. And then I jumped and I started flapping as hard as I could. Serious serious flappage here. I mean, I was going, I was going, and, and I think, I think for a brief moment, I cleared like two inches. Um, unfortunately, there's this law of gravity that uh, really took an effect. Now, flapping really hard while you're in the air will do two things. One, it, it won't work, and the second thing it'll do, it'll actually turn you upside down if you flap hard enough. And so I'm flapping, and I'm not going up, I'm going down, and I slowly start to turn upside down. And then what you do is you just start flapping harder, seeing the ground come. <laughs> and now I'm just flying straight toward the ground, so any ability I had is just taking me in this very direction. And so just head first straight to the ground. Now, God bless me in this moment, because there's this huge root that came up. Uh, it was about this wide, a huge root that came up. So before my head hit, my shoulder hit the root and just totally snapped my collarbone in two and it turned me over. And this was, I have never wanted to fly again in my whole entire life. So I you know, broken arm, broken collarbone laying right there and my cousin was just looking at me the whole time and thinking, this is not the stupidest cousin I've ever had in my life. This is not going to work. Go get rushed to the hospital, everything taken care of. Now I tell you that to say in my heart there was this desire to fly, so much so that I risk bodily harm to make it happen. But I was limited. There were limitations on me. There were certain rules that I just were, was not going to be able to break. There were, there, there were limitations on who I was and what I can do. And no amount of flapping, honestly, is going to get me anywhere close to being able to fly. Now, as I grew up, I was introduced to airplanes. Somebody made something that helped you fly. And when I saw airplanes, I was like, oh, now this is the way to do it. And now, all of a sudden, I've got this different set of rules and expectations in my life. I can literally go and purchase a ticket and get on an airplane, be in an airplane, and the rules change. This is a different gig now. I can sit back in my chair, and, and this thing can go 30,000 feet in the air, and it can go 500 miles an hour, and it can truck me all over the place. In this plane, I have changed the rules. I have changed my limitations. There's something significant about this, and all I did would choose to get aboard. The plane does all the work. It's doing everything for me. I just rest and settle in the fact that I am in a plane. That is a picture of the gospel, that in Christ, the limitations have completely changed. The rules have completely changed. Without Christ, we are bound to this world. We're bound to our sin. We're bound to our selfishness, our addictions, all those kind of things. Uh, we can flap our arms as hard as we want, but we're not going to get off the ground. And most of us end up breaking something in the process of trying to make our own selves better or find something that makes us happy. But in Christ, we step into a situation where we are limitless in what he offers and his grace and his mercy and his peace and his righteousness. 
In this moment, right now, as a Christ follower, if you're in Christ, God is literally pouring out his righteousness upon you, and he doesn't see your brokenness. He doesn't see what you did yesterday. He doesn't see what you're going to do tomorrow. He sees a righteous man or woman. In Christ, we are limitless in who he's called us to be. And that's the picture. That's what it means when, when Paul says, listen, hey, now we are in Christ, and it is an incredible thing that we're in him. All things are possible to those who love him and those who are in Christ. And you read the rest of this, uh, we are a new creation. This is another good phrase. The old has gone and the new has come. Old sin, old habits, old labels are gone. We are no longer defined by who we were. You ever met someone that was kind of defined by their sin, their selfishness? Oh, that guy, he's the angry guy. Oh, that, that, you know, that man, he's the alcoholic. This, this guy, he's the, he's the, we label people by their sin and their brokenness. And sometimes we even label ourselves that way. This is who I am. I'm never going to be anywhere different. And the gospel says that is a lie. The old is gone, buried, done with. Those labels that the world has put on you, God takes his little razor blade thing and just scrapes it off and he places on you a new label. Righteous daughter, righteous son of the most high God, beloved of the king of the universe. The old is gone and the new has come and God sees us that way. We have this amazing new identity and I would say this. If you struggle with your identity, if you struggle with depression about who you are and your circumstances, take the book of Ephesians. Just, just soak in that book. Just read it and let those words that Paul says remind you of your identity in Christ. Folks, the old is gone and the new has come and God sees you in an amazing new way. So the gospel is a daily reminder of who we are becoming, who God's called us to be. Now, we're not perfect None of us are perfect. If you're perfect, I'd say raise your hand and I'd say, oh, you're a liar, so you're not perfect anymore. Uh, We're not perfect. God's not calling us to a stream of perfection here, but we are moving toward God. And he is helping us journey that way because we're on the plane. We're in Christ, becoming who he's called us to be. Amen? Amen. There you go. You're with me. All right. So now we're going to jump in here to verse 18 because we're getting to more of the meat of where we're going to be going this morning. Verse 18 says this, and all this, everything that I just talked about is from God. God loves you that much that he's given all of this to you. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Let me just stop there, and if you want to underline that, that would be awesome too. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ. God is reconciling us to himself. Do do you get that? That God of the universe has looked and he has seen us, and he's been in pursuit of us, in pursuit of us to draw us back to him, to reconcile us back to who he is. Because God had an original plan. And that original plan was amazing. It was an epic idea where we would live full lives. I mean, we would have passion and we would have purpose and we'd have complete connection to our creator. And that's God's original idea that, that life would be full of risk, but that risk would be mitigated by the fact that we are, we're held by an amazing God walking in perfection and walking in unity with him. God said, that was the plan that I had for you, but, but we train wrecked it with our choices, and and not just Adam and Eve's choices. We've all train wrecked God's plan and purpose for our lives with the choices that we've made. We've train wrecked it. We introduced brokenness into the world. We've introduced brokenness to our lives. But God has refused to give up on any of you. There's not one of you in this room that God says, no, that one, I just, too far gone. God has refused to give up on us, and he has pursued us. I love 2 Peter uh, 3.9. It says this. I've got it underlined in my Bible. I just like writing in my Bible. It simply says this. The Lord is not slow keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. You ever need God's patience? He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God has not given up on us, and so he's pursued us to give us back what we lost. And that is an amazing truth, 
The gospel is our redemption. The gospel is God saying, listen, if you will just surrender to me, if you will just get on the plane, I will do the work of redemption in your heart and your life. And, and he brings that redemption to us through his grace. There's a song that, uh, that we sing sometimes in church, uh, and most of you know it. I'm going to make you sing it with me. I was going to take a risk this morning. Here's my risk. You'll probably recognize it. Just as soon as you do, jump in. I'm not a singer, but do this with me. It goes like this. Um, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that a wretch like me. Yeah. I once was lost, but now I'm what? finish it out was blind but now i see that is the gospel that is the picture of what god has done for us we were lost but now we're found you couldn't sing but god anointed you and you could that is what god has done for us and it's a beautiful thing it is a beautiful picture now here's the deal for today Here's, here's the twist in, in a little bit of the scriptures. I'm going to read the, the rest of verse 18 and, and probably all the way through 21 and we'll come back to where we're going to land. 18, the rest of it simply says this in 2 Corinthians 5. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was busy reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men and women's sin against themselves. No, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I think the second part of this verse 18 is, is the most powerful thing that I've seen in a long time. It is simply this, that God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God said, I'm going to take this amazing truth that is the gospel, this amazing truth, and I'm not going to give it to my angels who could stand up on the hillsides and go, Jesus is Lord. I'm not going to create this big, huge uh, banner in the sky, maybe right on the moon. Uh, Jesus is the king. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give the message of the gospel to the people who've experienced the gospel so that they can share it with the world. Now, on the surface, this sounds like the worst idea ever. Honestly, you think about it. You look at human history, and what have we done? We've, we failed. You know, outside of those first couple of chapters in Genesis when we were hitting a home run, and then we ran into that tree. Uh, but since then, since then, we've kind of faltered and failed at the things that God has called us to do. So why would God trust us with his message of reconciliation? Why would God do that? I mean, we could falter and fail in our own lives, and, and we could get settled in who we are and not ever share with another person how incredible the gospel of God is, how risky of God to do that. I think it reveals something about God's heart. One, he never gave up on our purpose, our purpose of sharing with other people how powerful he is. And two, it tells us a, a lot about how God loves to use sometimes the things most broken to bring glory to him. We're all broken in this life, and that's a clappable moment. We're all broken in this life. And God uses us as people most broken to simply say, I have met someone that has radically changed who I am. He took the brokenness that I am and he made it right and clean, and now i got a message to share. And God's heart for us is that he delights in you and I when we embrace the gospel, but he glories in us when we share it with other people. The truth of who he is. And, and I just want to take the time that we've got left and, and simply point out a few things of what it looks like to be a true ambassador of Christ. What it looks like when we really get the truth of the gospel and we're willing to be ministers of reconciliation. And, and so let me just dive in here a little bit. Uh, a truth that you all know. Here's, it, it's simply this. You all have gifts. Every single one of us. And they're all different. We've got some hospitality folks in the room. They're the ones that made your coffee. We have some, uh, you know, just 
folks that just love people, they're the ones that welcomed you when you came in the door. We have some folks whose gift is um, not liking people. They're the ones that were here early and just sat in the corner. So that's okay. We all have gifts, mercy, grace, peace. You all are gifted in, in certain ways, and you all, all of you, uh, have different personalities, and you connect with people differently. So all of us are completely different in our giftings. But get this. We all are natural evangelists. Now, I know what you're saying, Jim. No, I'm not. I don't have that gift. I totally, that's like seven people, and they have television shows, and those are the people with the gift of evangelism. No, get this. Every single one of us in this room are natural, natural evangelists. Say, Jim, how do you say that? Simply this. Uh, We evangelize more than we ever realize. You you think about uh, what evangelism is. Evangelism basically is cheerleading something that you love, getting excited and sharing the good news about something that that you're really passionate about. A new restaurant comes to town, Passions. I love that place. It's really awesome. I should get a gift certificate from those guys for mentioning it. Uh, Passions in in Orca, they're really a great restaurant. We love it. And so you go there and you eat, and what do you do? You're like, oh, I'm going to put it on Facebook, and I'm going to Twitter it, and I'm going to, it's awesome. I love this restaurant and their fajitas and it's good. We, we, we tell our friends and our families about this restaurant because it's amazing and we love it. Do you realize what you're doing? You're evangelizing. You're sharing the good news of something that you love. And, and it's not just with restaurants or movies. The Hobbit is coming out on Christmas and I'm so excited and I'll sure I'll tell you guys about it when, when I go see it. Uh, we do it with our football teams, which I love. College guy, but we often have our NFL teams, 49ers, Raiders, Seahawks. There may be others. Um, and so you, you've got your team that, that you love and they cheer. And what do you do when, when they're winning? They're on their run to the Super Bowl. Uh, um, when the Broncos, you know, play in the Super Bowl, are you, you going to be excited? Yeah, uh, Lynn's going, I, I'm praying for that right now. Do not disturb me. Yes, Lynn's going to be excited. He's going to wear a shirt and, and probably not change his undergarments until they go all the way to win. He's, he's going to be just that passionate about this journey. What we're going to be doing in those things that we love, we are evangelizing. We're sharing our passion and, and the thing that we love the most with those people around us. We don't care if they like it or not. We're going to share it with them. That is just, that's just an amazing thing. This, it is our love and our passion, and so we share it. So, ground zero. Every single one of us are natural evangelists. Why is it that we struggle sharing the gospel? Why is it we struggle talking about Jesus. I'd, I don't feel condemnation in this because I'm, I'm here with you. I'm not an evangelist by gifting. I, I think it comes down to the core of why we're even in the gospel right now is, is what needs to happen for us is honestly this. We need to get excited and passionate about what God has truly done in our lives. We need to get excited and passionate. When we, when we understand the gospel, when we understand just how truly amazing God is, Maybe it even starts when we understand just how truly broken we were and how we were standing on the ground, not able to do anything in our brokenness, and God said, I love you anyway. And he came in and and he redeemed us and he pours all this amazing stuff out on us. When we truly understand who God is and get the gospel, I tell you what, that should make us excited. The reason we do church on Sunday is to immerse ourselves in the passion and amazing grace and the truth of God to get us passionate so that we can share with the world what God has done in our lives. So it's not an evangelism message where I say, you need to go share. It's evangelism message simply this way. You need to go love. Fall in love with your creator. See how he's changed you, what he's done in your life, how the gospel really is a powerful, powerful truth. So I encourage you with that. You're a natural evangelist for the things that you love. Fall in love with God. Fall in love with Jesus and what he's done in your heart and your life. And then see exactly how that changes your conversations. This couple yesterday um, that, uh, that, that were, was getting married, it was crazy. It was in Santa Barbara. I had to rush down there. But I remember the moment. It, we were fisting to go up to these elevators to the top. And I was like, no, 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 no. God so makes a difference in marriage. So I pulled them together and said, the thing we've got to do is we've got to pray. And I did that not because it's a box that I have to check off. I did that because I know Jesus Christ changes marriages. 
and I'm passionate about it, and I'm excited about it, and I was not going to let either one of these people say, I do to each other without saying, I do to Jesus. And so we prayed together, and that comes out of my passion 